Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be here to give this lecture um, uh, in honor of Ronald Tress. Ronald Tress pushed a frontier in economics by recognizing the importance of data in the conduct of public policy. His vision was surely nurtured by his remarkably broad scholarship as well as his years of experience in the War Cabinet, where he served in the critical years from 1941 to 1947. He painstakingly worked on the construction of disaggregated labor and industry statistics. And more than anyone, he would have recognized the critical role that technology could play in that process. And indeed, I, as I learned as master of Birkbeck, one of his many legacies was to bring in the first electronic computer to the University of London. So really impressive vision. Now, in the spirit of linking data and policy, today I will talk about inflation, the key element in our policy remit. And more specifically, I will focus on the disconnect in the data between the facts, what inflation has actually been, and what households perceived it or expected it to be. What is behind this disconnect and what should be done about it? That will be my focus today. And I would like to emphasize uh, four points or takeaways. Um, first, since the Bank of England's independence in 1997, consumer price inflation um, has averaged 2% per year. It was actually exactly 2% in May 2019, the latest reading. Second, households' perceptions and expectations of inflation have averaged well above our target, which huge dispersion across different demographic groups. Moreover, a significant fraction of people today simply do not know what inflation is or might be. A pattern that appears to be particularly prevalent among households with lower income and education. Third, higher inflation expectations in principle reduce incentive to save for the future, increasing current spending. It is less evident how not knowing what inflation is or might be affects individual behavior. While bridging this gap between reality and expectations may not have a material macroeconomic impact, it could certainly improve the decision making of uninformed households. The challenge here, I will argue, is not just one for central bank communications, as some of the differences in perceptions and expectations may relate to varying degrees of financial literacy. The Bank of England has made significant efforts to improve its communications and educational outreach. The MPC, the Monetary Policy uh, Committee in particular, now publishes a visual summary of the inflation report, which aims to be accessible to a broad audience. The bank has also revamped its, its website and aims to speak in plain English as much, as much as possible. And my colleagues at the bank have produced a set of lessons on the economy and how it relates to the individual, a program called Economy, which is part of a broader effort to raise economic and financial literacy. But there's certainly scope to do more and for other organizations like colleges and universities to join this effort. Now, in my talk today, uh, if I manage, I will talk first about the inflation facts, then the role of inflation expectations in the economy, then I will uh, move to the data and show you the, uh, what the survey data say about households' median expectations, discuss this disconnect I mentioned between expectations and fact, Next, I will go beyond the median and talk about the differences across households uh, along different dimensions, gender, age, income. I'll briefly touch upon long-term expectations. And finally, I will discuss the implications this has and uh, touch also on the policy outlook for the, for the economy. So let me start with um, the facts about inflation. Since the Bank of England's independence in 1997, the Monetary Policy Committee has been tasked with achieving price stability, as defined by the government's inflation target. The formation of the MPC was a further step or further evolution of the UK monetary policy framework following the adoption of an explicit inflation target in 1992. 
Since 2004, the target has been set as an inflation rate of 2%, measured by the 12-month increase in the consumer price index. Now, let me illustrate uh, what happened um, since 76. This, this uh, graph here shows uh, the evolution of inflation measured as uh, the CPI uh, inflation index in uh, red and RPIX, the retail price index excluding mortgage interest rate uh, payment. Uh, in the horizontal axis you see the years going from 70, 76 to the present and the vertical axis has the inflation rate. So what we can see is that before the introduction of um, the inflation targeting in, in 92, inflation was very uh, volatile and on average uh, very high. Um, the average CPI inflation rate uh, during this period was uh, almost 8 and the RPI X was uh, above uh, 8%. The introduction of inflation targeting brought down inflation, uh, the inflation rate and uh, as we see since uh, 97 uh, the average inflation rate has been actually brought down to 2% as measured by the CPI index. Um, the other uh, uh, point I would like to highlight is that most of the misses during uh, the post-97 period uh, were due to the most uh, volatile components of inflation, typically food and energy prices, which uh, have an in, uh, a bigger fraction of imports uh, in them. So this can be seen in this graph, where I zoom in the period from 2004, when, when the target of CPI was introduced, till today. Uh, in black, you see CPI headline, which, as I said, averaged 2%, with some deviations over time. And in yellow, you see core inflation, which excludes those volatile components, and that um, index has been much closer to the 2% uh, target um, or uh, with fewer deviations from the target during the period. So let me talk about uh, inflation expectations, why we care. Um, or just before I get to that, I would like to say two things that uh, actually, two ideas that uh, came from academia. The timing and, and um, of, of the reduction of inflation was not a coincidence. The framework changes helped address two related causes of the high and volatile inflation in the 70s and 80s. Uh, one was the so-called time inconsistency problem. At any point in time, there is always a temptation to unexpectedly stimulate the economy, which once anticipated leads to an inflationary bias. And, um, so, that, so one of the aims of introducing a target uh, was to uh, solve that uh, time inconsistency problem. Second, delegating decisions of, on interest rates to a committee, the MPC, with an independent, uh, within an independent central bank has helped insulate monetary policy from political influences. Specifically, the risk that the electoral cycle leads politicians to push for extra stimulus ahead of a re-election also creating a tendency towards more volatile and, on average, uh, higher inflation. Both of these causes stem directly from the interaction between monetary policy and inflation expectations. When people expect that monetary policy will tend towards providing extra stimulus, they will also expect inflation to increase in future, and these higher expectations are likely to then fit in into economic conditions today. If those higher expectations are slow to change, they can make it more costly to reduce inflation. Monetary policy may have to be tight for a long period of time, imposing significant costs in the form of lower activity and higher unemployment before people lower their inflation expectations. So let me now go and talk a bit more about uh, inflation expectations. People's expectations of future inflation are key influences on current inflation. Indeed, a range of evidence supports the idea that the reduction in the level and volatility of inflation over the past 40 years has come about in large part due to central bank's success in reducing inflation expectations. Inflation expectations affect people's decisions in several ways. First, if households and companies expect prices to rise more quickly, they are likely to negotiate 
higher wage increases and companies are more likely to set higher prices for their goods and services. Second, changes in inflation expectations in financial markets are likely to affect the nominal value of the exchange rate, affecting import prices and CPI inflation. For both of these influences, it is likely to be the inflation expectations of firms and financial markets that matter more than those of households. Individual workers tend to have limited bargaining power in wage negotiations, so households' expectations often play little direct role in wage setting decisions. Perhaps as a result, many studies and discussions have tended to focus on the inflation expectations of companies, professional forecasters, and financial markets. This evidence, as well as a reading of the data generally suggests a good understanding of the inflation process and of how monetary policy behaves by these agents. But for household spending decisions, households' inflation expectations are likely to matter more. For a given level of interest rate, if households expect prices to rise more, that increases their incentive to spend today rather than saving. In other words, higher inflation expectations will reduce the real interest rate, boosting household consumption today. The resulting rise in demand relative to supply will then tend to push up inflation. In many of our economic models, this real interest rate channel is extremely powerful. In reality, its effects may be mitigated somewhat by the many households who are unable to smooth their consumption across time. It may, it may also be harder to identify at the relatively low rates of inflation that we now enjoy in, in the UK. Nonetheless, it is likely to be important for major purchases of durable goods such as houses and cars, especially at times when inflation expectations pick up ma markedly. As a result, in addition to any potential effects on the economy, a good understanding of inflation is likely to be useful to households making major financial decisions. A key benefit of low and stable inflation is that it is more predictable. With effective communication, that should have made it easier for households to track, predict, and act upon. But let me turn to what the data say. Um, since 1999, the Bank of England has conducted an inflation attitude surveys, uh, survey to track households' understanding of monetary issues. As part of that understanding, it includes various questions about households' inflation expectations. Specifically, it asks respondents how much they expect prices in the shops generally to change in the future, with the median response often taken as a summary measure. Households are asked their expectations for the next 12 months, the following 12 months, as long as uh, expectations in five years' uh, time. <coughs> The MPC also monitors a range of other measures of inflation expectations. In recent data, professional forecasters and companies' inflation expectations have remained close to or below their historical averages. Financial market inflation expectations, in contrast, have increased slightly over the past few quarters, especially at longer horizons. Households short-term inflation expectations have been relatively stable recently, although they have increased since their recent uh, lows in 2016, a period when CPI inflation itself had been close to zero. Let me illustrate this here. Um, you can see the evolution of expectations one year ahead, which are depicted in black, and five years ahead depicted in blue. The series starts uh, later. Um, households' long-term inflation expectations have uh, also picked up since 2016, with the bank survey measure increasing to a serious high of 3.8% in, the, in um, the second quarter. The increase in the bank survey in the latest data point has not been replicated in other indicators, and there's some evidence that it partly reflects some sampling volatility. But the general upward trend that you see since 2016 um, is uh, quite marked uh, or is coming from historically low levels. Part of the explanation may be that Brexit, more specifically its effect on sterling feeding through to realize CPI inflation, has increased some households' ex inflation expectations. I will come back to discuss a more nuanced effect of Brexit uncertainty on median expectations uh, later in, in my talk. 
Um, Households' inflation expectations are likely influenced by their inflation perceptions, what they think about inflation currently. So the bank survey also asks households what they think prices have, um, how they th think prices have changed over the last 12 months. And this is the yellow um, line in the graph. So as you can see here, um, the chart shows that there is a fairly close relation between perceptions of price rises over the past 12 months and expectations over the next 12 months, although less so with the long-term expectations in pink. How do households' perceptions of price rises compare to the measured CPI data? Well, you can uh, see it here. Uh, the chart shows that most households have perceived faster price rises than the actual change in CPI inflation, with the median perception around one percentage point higher on average over the period since 2004. 2004 is a relevant date when uh, we change from CPI target, uh, RPI ta targeting to uh, CPI. Households', households expectations of future price rises are also generally higher than exposed realized CPI inflation. This is true across surveys and is perhaps um, unsurprising given the close relationship between households' perceptions of inflation and their short-term expectations. It is also clearly evident in longer term expectations. Now, why my households perceive and expect higher inflation than measured CPI? Since the survey questions does not specify any particular price index, one possibility is that households are not referring to the same basket of goods and services. While the median household perception has been higher than CPI inflation since 2004, it has averaged around the same rate as RPI and RPIX inflation. RPI is no longer classed by the ONS as a national statistic, but it's still widely quoted in the media, and importantly, it's used to upgrade a range of highly visible items such as pensions, rail fares, and student loans. It seems possible that despite the MPC's inflation target changing to CPI after 2003, households may have continued referring to RPI and RPIX when answering the survey question. If so, it would suggest an additional benefit to having a single preferred measure of consumer prices. This is not the whole story, however. Compared to either price index, households' perceptions and expectations fail to accurately track the observed volatility in the inflation data. The wider economics literature suggests at least three other sets of reasons why households may perceive inflation differently to the aggregate statistics. Some psychological, some environmental, or some due to financial literacy. Um, so this uh, graph here is showing the different expectations measures from different surveys and the gap vis-a-vis uh, -vis CPI inflation in uh, black. <coughs> so let me talk about uh, what those psychological reasons might be. They relate to uh, which prices respondents, respondents are referring to when they answer the question. The ONS price indices are weighted according to average household spending patterns, but different households will consume different baskets of goods and services. There's no guarantee that even the median respondent faces the same basket as the CPI. Even if they face the same consumption basket, households may show other cognitive biases when answering the question. Households may focus on more visible price changes, such as energy and food. And indeed, as this plot illustrates, uh, this, uh, this is showing uh, inflation expectations uh, one year ahead, together with uh, the evolution of real oil prices. And uh, as you can see, there's a uh, quite tight connection between the two. So UK short-term inflation expectations seem to track petrol price, uh, prices, uh, a relation that is actually observed in other countries. There's a similar correlation with, with food prices, illustrated in this plot here. Um, more generally, households may also recall personal experience and place more weight on more salient events. 
There is evidence that large price changes are more memorable than small ones and that price increases more, increases more so, than, um, so they remember increases more than decreases. Similarly, people tend to remember recent and more frequent purchases more easily. The environmental factor relates to the aggregate level and volatility of inflation. In low inflation countries, it is less important to know the rate of price inflation. When making financial decisions, it is more costly to ignore the effects of inflation if prices are increasing at 20% or 100% per year relative to when they are increasing at only 2% per year. In the economics jargon, this is an example of rational inattention. The idea that attention is a, scar resor a scarce resource and is allocated to its best possible use. If inflation is not one of those uses, then it might just um, reflect the success of the current framework in producing a low inflation uh, environment. Sorry, I'm going the wrong way. There, there we are. According to uh, one opinion survey, less than 10% of people in the UK see inflation or prices as an important issue facing Britain today. And this is probably very different from when you were uh, writing your papers, Phil. <laughs> um, I mean, I remember from my undergraduate degree, we spent, uh, growing up in Argentina, we spent so much time on the accounting of inflation adjustment of, you know, for the balance sheets. Um, so this, as I was saying, uh, people report that inflation is a much, uh, much less of a concern today and that's a big difference from uh, what they were saying back in the 70s and 80s. The final factor which was previously discussed uh, by my colleagues Andy Holden and Ben, Brom ben Broadbent is financial literacy. This term is broadly understood as the skill to process economic information to make financial choices. It tends to be positively correlated with education and income. People who are more financially literate, literate tend to have a better idea of what inflation is or might be and consequently are able to make more informed consumption and saving decisions. Over the past three years, at least 15% of households have responded that they have no idea how prices have changed, up from around 10% at the end of the decade, suggesting that this factor may be becoming more important. To sum up, there are a number of reasons why households' perceptions and expectations of price changes may differ from measured CPI data. It could be that households are referring to a different basket, or uh, be it a different price index or a subset of more visible goods, people may rationally opt not to process all the information required to form accurate perceptions and expectations because the benefits do not justify the cost. Or it could be that different levels of financial literacy affect households' understanding of inflation. I'll uh, next explore these possibilities by looking at the more disaggregated data. So let me now go beyond the media. <coughs> as, uh, as I said previously, households tend to uh, differ, deviate quite material, materially from uh, the median. And this is illustrated in this uh, graph here. <coughs> this, uh, sh this shows the distribution of households, again, one year ahead inflation expectations in our bank survey. The red bar shows the fraction of households expecting inflation above 4%, this fraction here. Um, the green bars show the fraction of households expecting inflation uh, to be between 1% and 4%. In yellow you see the fraction that expects uh, inflation to be below 0 or at 0. And the black uh, bars shows uh, households that uh, answer that they have no idea. Now, there has consistently been a sizable fraction, fraction of respondents who have expected prices to rise far faster than the bank's 2% CPI inflation target. Since 2006, an average of one-third of the households who formed an expectation predicted inflation above 4%. In that period, measured CPI inflation has only risen above 4% around 10% of the time. Again, this might just reflect a different inflation basket, 
this fraction of respondents could consume a higher proportion of goods and services with higher price rises. However, the distribution also reveals a growing fraction of households who are unable to form inflation expectations at all. This proportion of households answering no idea is 19% in the latest bank survey, up from nearer 10% a decade ago. These are the black um, parts. The series are volatile, so determining the cause of the increase is difficult, but there does seem to have been an increase in no idea responses since the um, EU referendum in 2016. So Brexit uncertainty may be playing a role. This increase has been clearer still in questions on long-term inflation expectations, where actually 44% of households now have no idea what inflation will be in five years' time. Irrespective of why it has increased, the proportion of households given this response is quite large, suggesting that the gap between households' perceptions and reality may partly be due to differences in financial literacy. Disaggregating the service according to demographics provides further evidence on, on this point. So let me start with um, gender. Now, a common finding in many US studies has been that women have significantly higher inflation expectations than men. Interestingly, this does not seem to be the case in the UK, particularly when we look at the bank survey. So we see um, women um, in uh, blue here compared to men uh, in yellow, that's the bank survey. The dashed lines uh, with the same colors are the um, uh, basic survey, an alternative survey run by um, um, Barclays. Um, so the gaps there are not uh, nearly as apparent as in, uh, in the US um, studies. But there appears to be an important gender divide in responses depending on how the question is framed. Um, when asked about prices in general in the bank survey, that's the um, the bold lines, the distribution of responses between men and women is broadly similar. However, when asked about inflation rate in the Barclays basic survey, women are much more likely to respond that they don't know. This is consistent with findings in other countries and could relate to differences in financial literacy. Alternatively, it may relate to evidence from psychological research suggesting that in areas such as finance, meant to be more overconfident than women. But so here we, we can see um, the fraction of women responding that they don't know is almost twice as big as that of uh, men. And um, also the fraction of women uh, uh, reporting inflation between one and three close to the uh, target is, uh, is much, uh, much smaller. Um, now moving to uh, different age uh, cohorts. Again, many US studies have found that older generations have higher inflation expectations than younger ones. One theory is that people living through different times have built up different life experiences which affects their view of the future. For example, older generations that can vividly remember the high inflation of the 1970s will report higher expected inflation than younger generations who have only experienced low inflation. In the UK surveys, uh, the picture is mixed. Younger people do report lower expected price rises in the bank survey, but the opposite is true in the Barclays basic survey. So the pattern is um, uh, far from clear. Asking about the inflation rate again exacerbates the gaps among different groups. Older generations are better able to form expectations and also appear to predict movements in CPI inflation much more successfully. And these two graphs uh, contrast the uh, group of 15 to 24 years old versus 55 and more. And again, we see a lot more young people uh, reporting that um, they have no idea and Again, their expectations of inflation are, um, fewer of them expected to be um, close to target. Um, now, the final cut is um, uh, regards uh, differences uh, according to socioeconomic status as measured by the National Readership Survey classification. 
which ranks households according to the chief income earner's occupation. <coughs> it therefore captures a mix of income and education. And this is illustrated in this graph that shows that households in lower classification, uh, in the lower classification, uh, tend to have higher inflation expectations. That's the group in uh, yellow here. This again could be due to different consumption baskets if they consume more of the goods and services that have higher inflation rates. But households in the lowest classification group are also far less likely to be able to provide an expectation for future price changes. With around 35% answering no idea in the Barclays uh, basic survey, which is the dashed yellow line, compared to 15% of the top group in the same survey. The gap is again larger when asking about the inflation rate than uh, prices, suggesting again differences in financial literacy as, as a factor. And um, so this, the bold line again asks about prices generally, where the uh, dashed lines ask about inflation. <coughs> So let me touch briefly on long-term expectations. Uh, so far I have focused on one year ahead inflation expectations, uh, but long-term expectations are probably more important in our models and because they matter more for financial decisions. <coughs> now, um, what do we see here? The increase in median long-term inflation expectations in the latest bank survey to an uh, all-time high of 3.8% may appear concerning. Um, while something uh, we should watch closely, there's some evidence from the individual survey responses that at least part of the increase represents sampling volatility. And consistent with that hypothe hypothesis, it has not been replicated in the other surveys uh, we monitor. Over a long time, or horizon median long-term inflation expectations have increased since the EU referendum. And this is illustrated in uh, this plot here. This could be, as I said before, partly related to the referendum-driven fall in sterling and subsequent increase in CPI inflation. But the distribution of responses suggests in one's interpretation. While the median expectations has increased since 2016, the second quarter of 2016, the proportion of overall respondents expecting inflation above 3% has, has not uh, changed. The reason for the increase in uh, long-term expectations seems to be a rise in the proportion answering no idea. So, um, as you see in May, in May, in May 16, 34% uh, of households were reporting no idea. That increased to 44% in, in, in May 2019. One possibility is that given the climate of uncertainty since 2016, some households who had previously assumed that inflation would always return to target now feel unable to form any expectations at all. We should also bear in mind that people generally find it difficult to answer questions about things far in the future. In the latest survey, the number of no ideas increased from 19% to 44% as we extend the horizon from one year to, fi to five years. Um, this is this increasing here. Um, with a similar pattern evident uh, uh, in, in uh, the Barclays base basic survey. So let me stock, take stock here. When we look beneath the average, we see that there are specific groups of the population that tend to report price change expectations further from the inflation target and from the official data on CPI inflation. There are also differences in the characteristics of respondents unable to form an expectation of future inflation. These respondents are more likely to be women than men to be young than old, and to be in low-income occupations. <coughs> now, let me turn to the implications and the policy outlook. When it comes to setting monetary policy, these results call for caution in interpreting movements in the median household's inflation expectations. 
Interpreting the median is tricky when there are changes in the number of households who respond that they do not know. This is especially true for long-term inflation expectations, which are typically most re relevant for policy. For communicating monetary policy and improving public understanding of the inflation targeting framework, the large fraction of households who are unable to form an expectation of future inflation is a concern, particularly if it's due to lack of financial literacy. It makes a step we have been making on the MPC to improve our communications all the more crucial. For example, since 2017, as I mentioned before, we have published a visual summary of our inflation report, which aims to be accessible to a broader audience. More generally, the Bank of England has been taking steps to improve its educational outreach, as discussed by my colleagues recently, holding uh, the Governor Carney and um, also Ben Broadbent. Last year, the bank launched uh, a program called Economy, an educational program designed for young people aged from 11 to 16 years old, which aims to improve economic and financial literacy. The results I have presented today suggest that young people may particularly benefit from improved financial literacy, so improving education for school age children is crucial. But there's clearly also space to design programs for slightly older age groups. Here, in particular, there's scope for other institutions like universities, colleges, and even employers to help people develop the skills to make more informed choices. I've talked about a concrete challenge for communications when a significant and growing fraction of households do not have a strong understanding of the inflation process. Today, the challenge is made more difficult by the current economic outlook. Uncertainty is a word dominating the mood. Globally, uncertainty has shown up most clearly in interest rate expectations. Forward rate expectations have fallen in recent months, with mark market participants now expecting an imminent rate cut in the United States and a continued looser policy stance in the euro area. Risky asset prices had also weakened, although those falls have likely been cushioned by lower risk free rates. Increases in trade tensions have been one source of heightened uncertainty, adding further downside risks to a global economy where growth had already slowed over the past 18 months. And the further weakening in sentiment has been evident in output surveys, particularly in manufacturing. The change in sentiment is hard to reconcile with standard trade models, which would predict small direct effects of the tariffs announced so far on large economies such as the US. It is possible that sentiment is responding to broader risks or indirect spillovers not captured in our economic models. Some of the moves in risk-free curves are also no doubt related to a weaker global inflation outlook. Despite increases in wage growth, Core inflation has remained subdued in the US and in the Euro area. And this obviously increased market expectations of looser monetary policy. And like in the UK, there have been large falls in financial market measures of inflation expectations in both region, regions, in uh, both the US and, and the Euro area. Domestically, Brexit uncertainty continues to play a key role in financial market pricing, as set out recently by Governor Carney. As the perceived likelihood of a no-deal Brexit has risen, pricing has more clearly diverged with the MPC's forecast assumption of a smooth transition to a new trading arrangement. Sterling has depreciated and market implied bank rate expectations now suggest that the next move will be a cut. But those expectations average across a range of very different Brexit scenarios, with markets expecting looser policy and a weaker pound in a no deal scenario. The MPC has explained repeatedly how, in the event of a disorderly exit, the monetary policy response will depend on the balance of the effects on supply, demand, and the exchange rate. As I set out in March, in my view, it is more likely than not that the appropriate response would be a loosening, 
but this is not by no means certain. The fall in the in UK yields is not only due to perceived changes in the probabilities of different Brexit outcomes. Increased tr trade tensions and weaker global sentiment are also likely to have spilled over to the UK. Brexit uncertainty has also injected volatility into the outlook for UK activity, with stockpiling responsible for part of the strong growth figure in Q1, which looks likely to give way to a far weaker outturn in Q2. But the labour market remains tight, employment and hours worked growth have been strong, so too has unit labour cost growth, even if wage growth is showing signs of slowing slightly from its 2018 pace. Unconditional on a smooth Brexit scenario, a healthy labour market should continue to support household consumption. Moreover, although measures of core inflation remain subdued relative to labour costs, they have been stable in recent months. Nor are there many signs of weakness in the UK data on inflation expectations. As a result, I still expect that in a smooth Brexit scenario, a small amount of policy tightening will be required over the forecast period to keep demand growing in line with supply. As for the timing of any tightening, with inflation currently at 2% and likely to fall temporarily below target in the coming months, I did not feel compelled to vote for a policy change in our June meeting. If a Brexit agreement is reached, sterling is likely to appreciate, especially given the prospect of relatively looser monetary policy abroad. A stronger pound would serve to dampen import price growth, moderating upward pressure on CPI inflation from strong labour cost growth. Coupled with signs of a weaker global outlook, recent developments uh, likely lengthen the period until there is a sufficient pickup in inflationary, inflationary pressures for me to vote to raise uh, bank rate. I do not currently anticipate such a pickup in the next few months. As always, this is my expectation, not a promise. As the data evolves, so too will my view on the appropriate policy setting. If so, I will do my best to communicate any change in my thinking to economies, to financial markets, and importantly, to the general public. So let me uh, go back to my takeaways, and I'll be happy to discuss uh, questions uh, or any clarifications. Thank you.